There are six challenges when it comes to on-market, specifically wholesaling, but working with agents to get deals. I wanna talk about these six challenges and show you how to overcome them so that you can be ultra successful on market. If you overcome these six challenges, you will crush it on market. I now have agents in the, in the markets I target call me with their listings before they list them. What do we call that? Pocket listing. They call me and they say, Jerry, we're gonna list on Friday, it's Tuesday. Take a look at this property, give me your number. Let's see if we can get something done. They call me. Who wants agents calling you with distressed properties before they list them? I mean, there's nothing better than that because it's referral. Every agent that you work with, that you create this relationship with, is going to bring you deals ongoing in the future. I have deals now where I've bought dozens of properties from the same agents because they keep bringing me their deals. Nobody in this room should be able to walk out of here and say, I can't do this. I don't have enough money, I don't have this, I don't have that. You can do this right now today. You can walk out of here and go land an on-market deal with zero out of pocket. You really can. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. By the way, if you guys are crushing it already in your business and you have marketing budgets, why would you not implement this in your business? Why would you not do that? We do off-market. We spend the money on the marketing because it works. But this is an amazing way to supplement your paid expensive marketing you're doing for deals. So let's talk about these six challenges. The first challenge is dealing with a difficult agent or an incompetent agent. Anybody done that before? Yeah. Uh, by the way, um, any real estate agents? Any licensed? Okay. Me too. Me too. Don't take it personally if I talk bad about you. I actually love you very much. I do a lot of business with agents, but uh, some agents are very difficult to work with. What's the number one fear an agent has when working with a buyer, especially an investor, and a, really especially a wholesaler? What's their biggest fear? That they're not going to get paid, that you're gonna flake out and they're not gonna get paid. Those agents that raise their hands, uh, have you ever done a bunch of work for someone and not gotten paid? Yeah, you kind of build some resentment, don't you? Oh yeah, you get jaded real quickly, especially if you're working with investors and they're flaky. So real quickly, agents can get turned off by wholesalers, especially if they've had a bad experience in the past. All it takes is one bad experience for an agent with, an, with a wholesaler, and now all wholesalers are bad. You have to overcome that. I know going into every new agent relationship that they've probably had a bad experience with a previous wholesaler, and they're jaded now, and I've gotta overcome that. So, how do we do that? You've got to reassure that agent that you're dependable, that you're not flaky, that you close on your contracts, which means you better be that kind of person. So here's what I say. If I'm gonna wholesale my deal, the biggest fear that that agent has is that I'm not gonna perform. I'm gonna blow the deal up. So I'll say to the agent, I've got a lot going on right now and I'm gonna pass off this deal to one of my partners and or investors. What is that basically saying? Wholesaling who will step in and close, but don't worry, you don't have to do anything, I'll handle everything with title and we'll close on time and according to the contract and you're going to get paid your commission. Very important that you learn how to reassure agents. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in a minute. The second challenge with on market is a non-assignable contract. Remember, if you're on market, who writes the contract with the seller? Do you write the contract? The agent is gonna use their state approved contract. Now some states, and maybe you're in one of those states, that state approved contract that the real estate agent uses might have a no assignment clause. Or some contracts have where the seller actually has to check box or initial that they're allowing the contract to be assignable. So wherever, whatever state you're in or whenever you're looking at a contract on market, what had you better look for? Is there a no assignment clause in my contract? Now we can still wholesale if there is, we can double close, or I'll share with you a really quick, a really cool LLC strategy that we do. But you wanna look for that, and one way to overcome that is you can put your LLC or your entity name and or assigns, right? Which means you're the buyer, your entity's the buyer, or whatever other entity or person you assign your contract to. Now, when you put and or assigns in your contract, what is that doing? You're telling the agent that you're a wholesaler when you put and or assigns. So contracts are assignable unless stated otherwise. So do you need to put and or assigns if the contract does not state that it's not assignable? Meaning it's an assignable contract by not saying that it isn't. You don't. 
So you don't have to put that if you don't want to red flag the agent that you're, that you're possibly going to assign the contract. But my point is, watch for that. Now, how do we overcome that? Obviously, again, you can double close. Um, or one really cool strategy that I do quite a bit with my bank properties, all bank properties have a no assignment clause. REOs, short sales, they all have them, and you cannot remove it, they won't do it. I've tried, cross it out, they won't do it. So what you can do is, is you can set up an LLC, so a single member designated LLC, and then instead of assigning your contract, what do you do with your cash buyer, with your entity, and the entity all it owns is the contract, you can sell the membership rights of the LLC. No assignment, no change in buyer, the member changed. Everybody following me? Really cool strategy. If you guys want all the paperwork, I had my attorney build this all out. I'll give all of it to you for free, scripts on how to do it, everything to do. I call it the LLC hack strategy. I'll give that to you for free. Yeah, it's super powerful. Now let's talk about this a little bit. What happens when you tell an agent that you're a wholesaler or you plan on wholesaling the deal? Well, you just put a wall up, right? Because now you've got, you created this obstacle to overcome. So I never say wholesaling. I never use the word wholesaling. I never use the word wholesaler. I don't even say assignment. Here's what I say. Because we have multiple exit strategies with our properties, I need the flexibility in my contract for how we decide to take title. I may decide to close in my entity. I got multiple entities. I may decide to close in an entity of one of my partners or investors. Because I don't know at the time of signing my contract, I don't know which entity I'm gonna take title in in 30 days when we close, I need the flexibility to change that. Now, this is very common in commercial. Does commercial always have an assign, a, a, a and or signs clause? Yeah, because commercial investors have multiple entities. They may create a new one. Who knows what they're gonna do? So this is very common to be allowed to change how you take title, which is essentially what we're asking for with an and or assigns or an assignable contract. So that's the language, take a picture of that, that's a very powerful verbiage to use. Notice what I said there was, I want the ability to wholesale this deal. But what did I not say? Wholesaling, okay? If the agent directly says to me, Jerry, are you a wholesaler or are you going to wholesale this property? Here's my answer. Do you mean do I sometimes assign my contracts? Yes, all the time. We may decide to fix and flip this property or keep it as a rental. I work with a group of investors and partners, AKA what? My cash buyers. Are your cash buyers your partners? Yeah, of course they are, they're your partners. You partner with your cash buyer, your role in the partnership is to find the deal, you get paid out up front. they're your partner. Do partners get distributions in different ways? Yeah. That's all. So you've got to adapt a different mindset with how you communicate with agents. So going back to the script here, I work with a group of investors and partners and one of them may end up stepping in to close on this contract, but rest assured, remember, what do we have to do? Reassure, constantly reassure, but rest assured, I will perform on the contract and close on time. What I just said there in that, in that script is, I'm gonna wholesale this property. <laughs> without saying I'm gonna wholesale this property. Challenge number three is all on-market properties are gonna require a proof of funds, not always, but most likely a proof of funds and an earnest money deposit. You can pretty much bank on an earnest money deposit being every single on-market deal you do. So I wanna talk about these two things and some ideas on how to handle this. So first let's talk about proof of funds. Proof of funds means if you're making a cash offer, the agent wants to see that you actually have the funds that you're capable of performing in the amount of your offer, right? Well, proof, not all proof of funds are created equal. There's two types of proof of funds. One is a soft proof of funds. And a soft proof of funds, it's just a pre-approval letter. It's like if you go to get a loan, first you get a pre-approval, then you get underwritten, and then you get a hard proof of funds, right? Or a hard approval. Another example of a hard proof of funds would be a copy of a bank statement. Because you're showing, okay, here's liquid funds in the amount of my offer. That would be a hard proof of funds. Well, this is the chicken before the egg because what do you have to have in order to get a hard proof of funds from let's say a private lender or a hard money lender? What do you have to have? A contract. Well, they don't want to give you the contract until you provide the, the proof of funds, so here we are, the horse before the cart. So how do we overcome this? Well, first of all, a soft proof of funds works like 90% of the time. 
and we provide them, hard money lenders will provide them, basically says, you have a funding relationship with so-and-so, and if and when you get a deal that meets our requirements, we'll give you the money. Right, basically means nothing, but it's sufficient for, like I said, 90% of agents. You have the 10% of agents that are not gonna like a soft proof of funds, and they're gonna wanna see actual cash or a, an actual approval from a, from a hard money funding source. And so, how do you get that? Here's the workaround. And my students do this all the time, it works really well. The seller and the agent have to agree to this, so they may not agree to this, but here's what you would do. You say, listen, my partners and investors I work with, they can provide a hard proof of funds in the form of a full approval or a bank statement, just like you want, but I can't ask them for that unless I first have a fully executed contract on the property. So let's do this. Let's add a contingency clause to the contract that I will provide a hard proof of funds within 10 days of accepted contract. Now what does that give you time to do? If you're wholesaling, who are you gonna go to right now? Your cash buyer, and what are you gonna ask your cash buyer? For his proof of funds, exactly. So now your cash buyer's proof of funds, you provide that to the agent, or if you're gonna, if you're gonna take it down and fix and flip, you get your approval with your hard money lender or whatever, and you provide that proof of funds that they want. Make sense? Now let's talk about earnest money. Earnest money hurts a lot of new investors. I talked about you know no cost to be able to get on market deals. Earnest money is a good faith deposit that you put at the time of signing the contract. It's gonna sit in escrow. If you wholesale, then you get refunded that earnest money on the day of closing, right? So you're gonna float that money for a couple weeks at most. Well, the earnest money could be typically 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks. In some places like California, it's common to see 10% of the price. So now you could be talking 5,000 or more in earnest money. How do you handle that? If you don't have the cash to write the check for the earnest money, then here's the workaround for that. You put in your contract that the earnest money is gonna be paid at the end of your 10-day inspection. So assuming they allow you to have an inspection, right? What do you do now? Where do you get your earnest money? From your cash buyer, right? So you go to your cash buyer, they want your deal, you get them to give the 3,000 or 1,000 or whatever it is, they provide the earnest money, it goes into escrow and is applied as your earnest money. Make sense? This is how you can get your cash buyers to pay your earnest money if you don't have the thousand bucks or whatever it is. Using terms in a contract is how you strengthen your offer. So being able to close sooner, being able to put down biggest earnest money, waiving contingencies, those are all things that you use to make a stronger offer without jeopardizing price. So the more of this you do, then the, then the tougher it is for you to get that deal, right? Because you're asking for more. Whenever you ask the seller to give you more, it's gonna affect your ability to get that big discount. So just keep that in mind. I'm just sharing with you some ideas on how to overcome these challenges. Challenge number four is access to the property. Why is this a challenge, getting access to a property? Okay, why do you need access to the property? You gotta get your cash buyers, very good. You gotta get your cash buyers in that property. And what's the problem though with on market when you wanna look at the property? The agent wants to be there, right? Most agents wanna be present when you go to a property, right? That's part of, part of their responsibility as an agent. So that can become a challenge, can it? Here's what we do, two things. If the property's vacant, then we get this sentence added into the contract. Now again, the agent writes the contract, but you have to tell the agent what to put in the contract. So you would instruct the agent, I need you to put this in the contract. Seller to give buyer unrestricted access via a contract or lockbox. Okay, now if it's written in the contract and the seller agrees to it, can you go to the property without the agent being there? Yes, if it's in the contract and the seller agrees to it, yes. So if it's vacant, I push really hard for this. What's the language you can share as to why? That's right, contractors, listen, me and or my investors, whenever I say me and or my investors or partners, what am I saying? me and or my cash buyers need to be able to go into this property so that we can send our contractors so that we can get bids and create a scope of work and be ready. I can't buy a property and not have a plan on my rehab. I need this window of time from now till closing to get ready for the rehab. Me and or my investors or partners. So I need access to the property. If it's occupied, then we also have put in the contract seller to give buyer access with 24 hour notice. You might have a tenant or a homeowner in the property if I don't get this in writing, what could be a problem? Tenant or seller not giving access to the property, which happens all the time. 
So you've got to get this in writing to be able to get that access. By the way, we do what we call an inspection party. And we set one time, we send all our cash buyers to the property at that two hour window. If there's a tenant or a seller in the property, we give them a hundred dollar gift card and say go shopping and uh, get them out of the house. And we try to create like, a, like an auction environment at the property. Everyone will bid your property up. Okay, challenge number five is cash buyers don't like on market. Has anybody taken an on market deal to a cash buyer and they say, oh, this is listed for sale. I don't want this. Anybody done that? Blows my mind because what does it matter? Does do the numbers work? That's what really should matter. And I'm a fix and flipper and I buy a ton of properties from wholesalers from on market deals. I don't care if it was listed for sale. Does it meet my numbers? What do you think it is? Why would a cash buyer be super excited about the same deal if it was off market, but for some reason because it's on market, now they don't like the deal? There's this perception that it was public and you got the deal, not them, or somehow it's not a deal. I had a really funny experience happen in uh, Philadelphia. I did a deal there. The property came out for sale for 99.9. I made a cash offer and got the deal right away for 75. On market, I got up for 75. I took it to a cash buyer that was flipping houses. I didn't, I didn't know this guy, but I took it to this guy that I saw flipping houses in the neighborhood. And I said, hey, I got this great deal. And he looks at it and says, uh, I want it. Now, the price I took it to him at was 125. Listed for, for 100, I got it for 75. He said yes at 125. He's like, I want it, fits my numbers, it's in my neighborhood, I want it. Okay, great. Calls me back five minutes later and says, dude, I just Googled this, it's pending right now at 99.9. And I said, I know it's on market. I got the contract. He's like, well, Jerry, why would I pay 125 if it's listed for 99.9? And I said, because 125 is an awesome deal, which you just told me it was before you found out it was on market. And he says, well, I could have bought it for 100. And I said, but you didn't, I did. <laughs> so what did I do? Took it to another cash buyer for 125 and made a $50,000 assignment fee. So here's the thing, you're going to run into cash buyers that for whatever reason, their ego or whatever is in the way, they're gonna say, I'm not interested, it's on market. I actually preempt this. So if you guys are wholesaling on market, here's what you need to do. I'm a very relationship driven guy with cash buyers. I want a relationship with my cash buyers. I think in 2023 and forward, your relationships are gonna mean more than anything. I would rather have 100 cash buyers that I have a relationship with than 10,000 cash buyers on a list that I don't even know. Who would agree with me? Way more powerful. So I go to my cash buyers and I say, listen, if I find an on-market deal and I negotiate and I get the contract and I bring it to you at your exact buy box, will you have an issue if it's on market? And what are most cash buyers gonna say? Well, you know, if it fits my numbers, I, you know, I guess I don't really care uh, as long as it's a deal. Right, that's what most cash buyers are gonna tell you and, it, and you're preparing them for it. So then later when you bring it to them, you're like, dude, tell me how this is not a deal. If it's your numbers, what's the problem here? And again, I love buying on market property. So if a wholesaler brings me a deal, I don't care if they got the deal for a dollar or 50 grand or whatever, I look at my number that I need to make. I want my wholesalers to be extremely successful. I sat at a closing one time and I had no idea what the wholesaler was making until I saw in the closing statement a $100,000 assignment fee. And I turned and I looked at him and I said, good for you, dude. <laughs> I put my arm on his shoulder and I said, dude, how's this feel? And he goes, oh, dude, I was so freaking out that when you saw my assignment fee, you were gonna lose it. And I said, how do we do 10 more of these? because I'm so happy that I'm getting this deal. How do you win big like this? I wanna be your buyer and do 10 more of these with you where you make 100 grand. Good for you, you got an awesome deal. You deserve every penny of this $100,000 check you're about, to, you're about to get. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's what it is. Yep. Okay, challenge number six is on market is competitive. We know that because it's on market means it's public, which means everybody and their brother knows about it. So you have to create a competitive advantage if you're going to succeed on market. Now I'm gonna share with you something that I've been teaching for years. Uh, I've been the only guy in the world that taught on market for a long time. Now it's becoming very normal to teach this strategy. I call it the double dip technique. Anybody heard that? Anybody seen my YouTube videos where I demonstrate this? I do a lot of live calls and show how to do this. I call it the double dip technique. Remember, 
There are two agents typically involved in an on-market transaction. The listing agent, they get 3%, and the buyer's agent, they get 3%. Seller pays all of it, but there's usually two agents involved in the transaction. What I wanna do is I wanna take all of it and give it all to the listing agent. I don't work with a buyer's agent. Okay, I don't work with a buyer's agent. I go directly to the listing agent on every single deal. And I tell listing agents, or I tell all agents, don't send me other people's listings. I can find those on my own, that's easy. But when you get a listing with a seller and it's distressed and they're motivated, I'm your buyer and I'll let you represent me as the buyer's agent. What do we call that technically? What do we call that? Dual agency. Now we're in Florida. Florida is a non-dual agency state. So is Texas and a handful of others. Does this work in Florida? Yes, it works in Florida. Now it might not be dual agency, but what's the point? The point of this is what? The point of this is I'm gonna motivate the listing agent to wanna work with me. So what can you do in Florida that's not dual agency? Transaction coordinator, yeah, which means they don't really represent anybody. Now they gotta get the seller to agree to this, but a lot of sellers are like, I don't care, just get my deal done. We're talking about distressed property. Does a distressed, motivated seller care if the agent is making 6% commission? No, they've already committed to pay 6% commission. They don't really care who gets the 6%. What do they care about? Getting their property sold that they don't want anymore. That's what they care about. What's another one you can do in Florida? Designated agency, what is that? Designated agency is when another agent in the same office is, represents the buyer. So what do agents do? Jerry's offering the other half of the commission. What do those agents do? They refer the buyer side to their buddy in the office and get what? Half of that side. So maybe they're not making six, but they're making four and a half for sure. Maybe more. So the point is what? We're taking this 3% over here and we're trying to feed this back to the listing agent so that they're excited, motivated, interested. They want to bring distressed properties to you. If there are 10 offers on a deal and nine of them are with buyer's agents and Jerry comes in and offers the buyer's agent commission to the listing agent, who do you think the agent's gonna work the hardest for to get the deal to? Jerry. You better believe it, it's just human nature. Do, do real estate agents like money? Yes. Okay, they like money. So they're gonna be highly motivated to see you win. Now they gotta follow their fiduciary duties and all of that, I get that. My point is, is that they're going to wanna work with you. You're gonna create a competitive advantage by creating these relationships. And my strategy is not to cold call agents, I don't do that. What I do is I call agents on their listings. Why is that so powerful? Because they're gonna freaking pick up the phone. And when they don't pick up the phone, guess what I text them? I say, I'm interested in your property on 123 Main Street, I'm an investor and I wanna make an all cash offer, call me. And what do they do? They call me. And then when they call me, my offer is $100,000 below list price, right, that's normal. And I don't care, why? Why am I calling the agent? That's right, it's never about the deal in hand, it's always about the relationship. But the deal at hand gets me into a conversation, gets me on the phone, gets them talking to me. So now I get them on the phone, I say, you know what? My offer's way below where you're listed right now. I'm actually kind of embarrassed to tell you my offer because it's so low. But hey, while I got you on the phone right now, I'll let you represent me on all and any listings that you get. Do you have anything else right now? Guess what happens nine out of 10 times? Oh man, I got this property I can't sell. It's been sitting forever. It's got issues. Or really, are you kidding? I've got a property coming up. I'm meeting with a seller today. We're gonna sign. Uh, it needs a lot of work. That happens. And I tell all listing agents, I say, here's what I want you to do. I want you to save my number in your phone as Jerry, name of the county or zip code or market or whatever area you target, cash buyer. And I, sell, I tell them, when you get a distressed property, call me. I'm your buyer. I'm your buyer in this area, in this market. I will give you an offer on every property you get. And then what do I do? I put that agent, if they're wholesaler friendly, if they're investor friendly, I put them in my CRM and they go into a drip campaign. What does that mean? It means every week they get a text, they get an email that says what? Hey, Mr. Agent, Mrs. Agent, it's Jerry, remember me? I'm your cash buyer in this area. You got anything coming up? You got any properties you can't sell that I can make a cash offer on? It's front of mind is what wins, right? Because that agent's gonna talk to 100 other people and they're gonna forget about you. In six months, when they get that motivated seller to stress property and they think, man, this thing is gonna be a nightmare to sell on market. We're gonna have inspection issues. We're gonna have appraisal issues. This place, I can't get the seller to clean this place up. How am I gonna sell this property? This is gonna be a nightmare. Do agents think that? 
all you agents, have you ever tried to sell a hoarder house on market? How fun is that, right? Hey, can we make a path for showings? It'd be really helpful. I just need a walkway, that's all I need, so we can get through these rooms. Yeah, that's really hard for an agent to sell that. Would an agent love to be able to make a phone call to a Jerry Norton, sell that property for cash, not go on market, not list, and make 6% commission in the process that the seller pays for? Heck yeah, you better believe it. That's the relationship you're looking to set up. Okay, so double dip technique, everybody clear on that? Super important, do not use a buyer's agent. I'm licensed. I have to disclose I'm licensed. By the way, I'm a big fan of being licensed if you're a wholesaler and a flipper. There are so many advantages to having your license. If anybody ever tells you don't get your license because you're, you're an investor, uh, ask them why, and then they're gonna go, uh, mm, uh, well, it's bad, and they're not gonna give you a real reason. The only thing you really have to do if you're licensed as an investor is you have to disclose. That's the number one rule, disclosure. So guess what my contracts say when I buy a property? Buyer is a licensed agent. Guess what my contract says in writing, so now I've disclosed. Guess what my contract says when I sell? Seller is a licensed agent, I've just disclosed. I've met my responsibility as a licensed agent. Does a motivated seller who wants to sell their property for cash convenience, as is, all of those things, do they care if you're a licensed agent? They don't care. What do they care about? Closing next Friday so they can get out of this property they don't want anymore, that's what they care about. When I go into an appointment or on a phone call, my team is trained that we're gonna walk out of this thing with something. We're either gonna get a low cash offer, we're either gonna get a creative financing deal, or we're gonna list it for them. So if they want retail, fine, we'll list it for you. Because a listing fee at 3% is almost a wholesale fee, depending on the price point, isn't it? Yeah, if you got your real estate license, you can do that. What if you don't wanna list properties? You can refer it and get 1.5% and let somebody else list it. How cool is that? Now you can't get a referral fee unless what? You have a real estate license, is that worth it? Just that alone is gonna pay for your real estate license and your ongoing fees and all of that 100 times over. By the way, I'll give you all my scripts, and they're free, you can download those, and I walk through how to, how to have these conversations with agents, how to overcome objections, it's super helpful. I even give you my uh, offer sheet, which is what you give the agent so they know what to fill out in the contract, because again, agent fills out the contract. Key number two to, to really dominating on market is speed. Speed to the offer. So, we have all automated searches set up. I've got a free tool that finds underpriced on-market properties. It's called Data Cruncher. If you go to mydatacruncher.com, you can use that. It's totally free. We built this software to find underpriced on-market listings. When a new property comes out for sale that's distressed, my goal is we're on the phone with that agent within minutes because I'm looking for all the stars to align. For all the stars to align, I need an agent who is very motivated about double dipping with me, and I need a seller who's willing to lock up a contract and not wait for showings. If a seller says I wanna wait for showings, what does that now allow for everybody else to do? Most investors are lazy. Most flippers are lazy. Really good wholesalers aren't lazy, they're hustlers. Your average wholesalers are lazy. Meaning, they're gonna go look at that property tomorrow. It came out at 8 p.m., they're gonna go look at it tomorrow. If a new listing comes out at 8 p.m., what does that mean? It means what's the agent doing right now in the MLS? entering a property. So when that property comes out at 8 p.m. and you call them at 8.01, are they probably gonna answer the phone? Yeah, because they're working right now. Whenever a property comes out for sale, you wanna be on the phone with that agent immediately offering the double dip, offering the cash offer. Here's, what it, here's how it goes for me. I'll tell agents, I'll say, if you wanna uh, make 10 times the amount of money that you're making right now, let me coach you how. Let me teach you how. We have a window right now. This distressed property just came out, it's priced pretty good. I got a cash offer to make. You've gotta call the seller right now and you've gotta sell them on why they should take my offer and cancel any showings and get the deal done right now. And if that happens, we'll have a contract, go back and forth, we'll get a deal done and I'll lock it up within minutes of a new property coming out for sale. If the agent says, well, you know, the seller wants to wait three days before they consider any offers, I'm not done, I don't give up, but what does that now mean? I missed a window, now I gotta compete, which is fine, but now it means I gotta compete with other people who are lazier than me to have time to get their offers in. But speed is key. Now, the opposite, the longest days on market are also good deals to go after. So stuff that's been sitting around forever. Now those deals, guess what I offer? Creative financing, why? Who heard Pace uh, talk yesterday about creative financing? Who's excited about creative financing? Yeah, super exciting. Why would a property that's been listed forever and not selling, why would that be a good creative financing offer? It's probably a sub two, meaning what? Why isn't it selling? 
because there's a mortgage that's preventing the seller from coming down on price. If they come down anymore on price, then they're gonna owe money at closing. How common is this gonna be? Oh, super common, very common, because as the market comes down, people that recently bought are gonna become upside down, meaning they're gonna owe more than it'll sell for. Which means what, if you're a creative finance person? Subject to, baby. So then I call the agent and I say, hey, I see your property's been listed forever. It's not selling, huh? Uh, why aren't you dropping the price? And guess what the agent's gonna say? Well, we can't. They owe more. And then what do you roll into? How would you like it if I took over the payments and blah, 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 subject to? And it's a numbers game. Tip number three is this is just a numbers game. Let me ask you guys a question. Who would be willing to make five offers a day to real estate agents for 30 days or for four weeks? Let's say, let's say Monday through Friday, five offers a day, that's 25 a week, that's 100 a month. I promise you, if you make 100 offers a month to real estate agents on distressed properties, you will get a deal. You will get a deal. It's just a numbers game. Somebody's gonna say yes to your low offer. So if you know that, then are, can you take the emotion completely out of the game? Yeah, it's just non-emotional now, meaning you don't get affected by rejection. What's the biggest fear we have in this business, especially if you're new? Rejection. Why do we have such a hard time with rejection? Who knows? Why is rejection so hard? Oh, you're so tired of hearing no. Like no becomes this negative thing now. Like no, 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 no. My 17 year old's doing this business and uh, he, he doesn't really seem affected by rejection. And it's just because he hasn't been conditioned enough in life that no, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. And I've tried to raise him where no isn't really a thing. Yeah, you can. Think about a way to do it and you can do whatever you want in life. So we were trained and conditioned that no is a bad thing. Here's my philosophy. Motivation changes monthly, motivation changes weekly, and motivation changes daily. No never means no, no just means what? No right now. I had a seller one time where we made our low offer, they said no, I'll never sell it for that much. Five minutes later he calls back and says, is your price still good? <laughs> and we're like, yeah, well, what's going on? And he's like, as soon as I hung up the phone with you, the city called me and somebody threw a rock in the window and now I'm getting a citation, I gotta pay a fine, and I gotta go over there and send someone to like board up this window. I'm just so sick and tired of this property, I wanna get rid of this right now. He went from completely unmotivated to extremely motivated in five minutes, okay? Knowing that about humans, have you ever been in a good mood and then pissed off the next minute? Okay, so knowing that about humans means that when someone says no, it just means no right now, which means I'm gonna, I'll tell agents, just so you know, I'm gonna check in with you, and if your property's still listed, I'm gonna call and make an offer again. And I'll have agents that are like, Jerry, why are you calling me? And I'll say, did you sell that property? And they're like, no. Does the seller wanna sell it? Yes. Well then, what are we talking about here? Of course I'm calling, well, here's my offer, like present my offer again. Well, they've already said no to your offer five times. Yeah, but they might say yes this time, so present my offer, let's go, right? And sellers as well. Sellers, it's, it's about persistence. Did you know that the, the national average, this is put out by the National Association of Sales, whatever, salespeople, that 80% of sales are made on the fifth to 12th follow-up. Do you guys know that? The fifth to 12th follow-up is where 80% of sales happen. This is kind of like industry-wide. So what does that mean? It means we follow up like crazy. Just follow up like crazy. So I want you to play this as a numbers game. I want you to think about this as the more offers I make, the more deals I'll get, the more money I'll make. Repeat that with me, guys. The more offers I make, the more deals I'll get, the more money I'll make. It's just a numbers game. Okay, that's all this is. Okay, that's all I got, guys. Thank you.